All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the August edition of the Iowa Pork Industry Center monthly webinar series. I'm tonight's host, Dr. Chris Rodemaker. I'm a clinical professor at the Iowa State University College of Veterinary Medicine and also the Associate Director of the Iowa Pork Industry Center. Tonight, it's my honor to welcome two of our esteemed nutrition faculty members here at Iowa State to discuss some of their recent collaborative research. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce them now. Uh, Dr. Laura Greiner is an assistant professor here at the Iowa State at Iowa State University in the Department of Animal Science and also serves as the director of the Iowa Pork Industry Center. Dr. Greiner teaches undergraduate swine science courses and has established a research group that conducts research centered around addressing contemporary challenges in swine production. Dr. Nick Gabler is the inaugural John F. Patience Professor in Swine Nutrition in the Department of Animal Science here at Iowa State. Dr. Gabler has an active and diverse research program that focuses on understanding and improving swine feed efficiency, nutrition by health interactions, lean tissue accretion, and intestinal physiology of pigs, utilizing both basic and applied cellular and whole animal approaches. So with that, Nick and Laura, we'll let you take it away. One one last thing for the panelists uh, and for the audience, if you want to go ahead and uh, uh, put any questions in the chat, we'll go ahead and answer those when Nick and Laura gets finished up. Now we'll turn it over to our two guests. All right, thank you, Chris, for the introduction and welcome everyone to this webinar. So. Um, this afternoon, we're going to talk about the effects of pushing high dietary soybean meal inclusion rates in growth finishing pig diets. So, the reason why we're doing this is that we keep hearing um, for the last year or so, last 18 months, about the expected soybean crush that's coming to the Midwest or, and to, to North America. Now, as you can see from this figure or at least from this image from on the right hand side of the, um, of the screen here, is that there's been a big push to expand soybean meal crushing capacity. That's whether through expanding um, existing plant capacity or actually building new plants. And particularly, we see this. Well, particularly, we see this up around up in kind of Iowa, and also up into southern Minnesota and through to Illinois. And so, with this increased um, expected increase in soybean meal that will be that will result from this crush, which is primarily being driven by the high demand for soy oil, for biodiesel, and other other renewable energy sources, we're expecting to see a lot more soybean meal and soy-based products actually be available for animal nutrition and particularly for pigs. And as soybean meal is quite high right now, like four hundred and something dollars a ton. We probably um, could expect it's been a, been estimated that soybean meal could come down to around that $200 a ton, and this is going to change the economical output of how we may utilize soybean meal actually within diets if we do see this crush and also this big increase in, in soybean meal um, production that's going to occur. And then this work, uh, this in, um, impeding or in, this crush that's going to potentially happen, or this increase in soybean meal and soy products can also have an impact then on manure quality and how we're actually going to manage the pit and the environment. So today's talk, we're not really going to focus too much on nutrient content and managing manure, but we're actually going to focus more on the use of feeding and really pushing soybean meal inclusion rates in growth finished pig diets. And so really soybean meal is a great protein source for pigs. It provides a really good amino acid profile, especially on the essential side. Um, that kind of in, in combination with corn actually can provide pigs a lot of the amino acid and even energy nutrition that they need to adequately support growth. Also provide um, opportunity for optimal nitrogen balance and also leads to good carcass merit. However, if we do feed too much protein, we can actually have excess um, excretion of nitrogen and that may or may not be a, um, a bad thing, depending on the context or the circumstances of how you value that extra nitrogen that goes actually into the pit. And so really our objective for this is that if we, we're trying to kind of get ahead of this potential where if we have a whole lot of soybean meal that's gonna be available for pig producers and nutritionists to use in diets, we want to know that you know, if it comes cost effective, how will a finishing pig or growth finished pig, how will they handle feeding high amounts of soybean meal? And we're talking about the inclusion rates of soybean meal that will meet or even really exceed requirements. 
So if a producer wants to displace the, displace the amount of corn in the diet because soybean meal becomes very cheap and cost effective, what happens if they formulate 40% bean meal into a diet or even go 60% or more? And so for this study, we really want to evaluate how much soybean meal can we feed a pig and just give us some framework for, yeah, is it gonna be detrimental to a pig or is it gonna be positive on carcass merit? Is it gonna be, what's it gonna do for feed efficiency? And so we developed two objectives for this particular set of work. And it was two kind of independent studies that, that relate to each other. In the first objective, Laura, Laura Griner and myself, or Dr. Griner's group and myself, and my research group, we formulated an experiment where we wanted to evaluate the performance of pigs with varying levels of soybean meal. And that's really just looking at the impact on pig growth, um, feed efficiency, on nitrogen balance, which includes retention, excretion, and also on carcass merit. In the second objective of this work, we also, um, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Lance Baumgard and also um, Dr. Jason Ross, they want to see what would be the impact of feeding diets high in soybean meal, like above requirement to meet amino acid needs. Um, how would that compare to a conventional corn soy diet if we fed this to, to these finishing pigs during times of heat stress? And so would we see an increase in kind of heat production and then would it be a negative, um, would it lead to negative aspects with regard to pig health as they grow through a, a diurnal heat stress um, challenge model? So really for the first objective, our design for this study was to actually, we utilized 240 pigs. They were about 25 pounds, oh sorry, 50 pounds, 23, 24 kilogram pigs. So PIC genetics, the 337, 1050s. And we sorted these pigs across 60 pens with approximately um, four pigs per pen. And we had 20 replicates per diet and we end, had three dietary treatments, which I'll explain in the next couple of slides. The health status of these pigs is that they were PERS, they were PERS stable, they were also Lysonia stable and Mycoplasma stable. In other words, they've been vaccinated for all these particular pathogens and then they were PED negative. So the three dietary treatments that we settled on after much debate and going around and around is we decided to go with treatment one would just be our conventional growth finish type diet, which would be a, we, we classified as a low or L soybean meal, LSB, LB, sorry, LSBM diet. And that is really just utilizing high levels of synthetic lysine, methionine, threonine, et cetera, in combination with soybean meal and corn to actually meet the amino acid requirements of the pig. And so we didn't feed any more soybean meal to re really meet any, anything beyond the, just meeting those requirements. In the second diet that we formulated, is, we classified it as the medium soybean meal. And with this one, we formulated soybean meal in, the, in these diets over, over the four phases that we fed these diets. We, we formulated soybean meal to meet 100% of the lysine requirement for that pig at that particular stage. In other words, there was no synthetic lysine in these diets. And so we used the soybean meal just to meet 100% of the lysine requirement. And our third diet was we classified as the high soybean meal diet. And that's the addition or the inclusion of soybean meal and in um, above and beyond diet too, but also to replace corn. And we fed this at about equal spacing from what the low soybean meal and the high soybean meal inclusion rates was. So, uh, so hypothetically, if there was a 20% difference in soybean meal inclusion between diets one and two, or between the low and the medium, we increased the gap between the medium and the high by 20%. So we added in that difference there. And so this gave us three graded levels. And one thing I'm gonna say is that we really don't know where the ceiling really is with regard to how high we could actually formulate soybean meal in, into these. We just want to have kind of some equal spacing and just push the pig beyond the requirement level. And then this is roughly a hundred day study. As I said before, we broke this into four dietary phases, which the first phase went for about 28 days. And then we went from day 29 to 56 for phase two. Phase three was actually um, day 56 to 84. And then day 84 to 98 was our, was our phase four. And then below here is actually what I have uh, actually laid out what our soybean meal inclusion rates were within each of the phases. So for instance, in phase one, in treatment one, which is our control diet, we had 26% soybean meal. In our medium diet, we had 37%. In our high diet, we had 48% soybean meal. 
And as you can see, as the lysine requirement drops, as we as pigs get older, we're dropping the inclusion rate of soybean meal, so 26 down to 19 percent, with this with the addition of some synthetic amino acids. But then 30 percent soybean meal in this formulation for phase two met all the lysine requirements um, that was needed for that particular diet, and so on through phases three and four. So here's a quick look at what our diets look like. Um, as you can as you can see here in the top red box. Um, we just had an increasing amount of soybean meal. And we displaced corn with with that. Uh, the other thing is we only had synthetic lysine in the low soybean meal diet, and there was no synthetic lysine in the medium or the high soybean meal diet. We did add a little bit of synthetic threonine and methionine just to meet the amino acid um, requirements that we needed um, in the medium diet, but there was no synthetic amino acids added to the high soybean meal diet. This is just an example of phase one. If we look at diet composition here for phase one, just as an example, because phase two, three, and four are all replicate the same profile, same pattern here. We try um, we formulated the diets to be all isochloric. In this case, for this phase one diet, we all at um, 3.2 megacals per kilogram. And then by default, as we increase soybean meal inclusion rates in these diets, our crude protein of these diets went from seven to or eighteen percent up to about twenty-six percent um, um, across the three diets. Uh, also, as you can see, we met the lysine requirement, SOD lysine requirement with our with our low and medium soybean meal inclusion rates. However, because we've formulated diets to exceed the minimum requirements for SOD lysine that we wanted, we let that float because we just wanted to put in an arbitrary number that was higher than um, uh, than what requirement would be. We ended up having a one point uh, sorry one point three two SOD lysine in our high soybean meal diet. And then as, as a result of this, we ended up having the three diets with diet with the low and the medium diet having the same grams of SOD li um, uh, lysine to, to energy, to ME, being 3.32 for both the low and the medium. But then our lysine to energy ratios actually went up because of the higher lysine in our high, um, high soybean meal diets. And this is the same thing that we would see for all four. So I'm not going to show you all four diet compositions. If anyone would like to know more, please email Laura and I, we can share those diets with you. So further on the experimental design, we weighed pigs on at the start of the study, then on phase changes. And then we also, um, that was to calculate out pen average daily gain, feed intakes and feed efficiencies to then get to an individual pig basis. Pen was our experimental unit on this. And then um, pigs were then marketed in two cuts at, um, at day 98 was the first cut and the second cut went out at day 100 and, 112. And then um, we also at the plant, this was through Tyson's Perry, we got back fat, loin depth and, and then the carcass weight. During phase three, we, um, we put some pigs, we put six pigs per treatment into a nitrogen balance study into metabolism crates, where we looked at nitrogen input so in other words, feed intake, how much nitrogen they're consuming. We looked at ex total tract excretion and urine and feces, and then we calculated out retention for this, just to get an idea of how much nitrogen is actually passing through the pig or actually being retained in the, under these three dietary um, feeding, um, feeding studies. And so this is an example for our nitrogen balance. We put them into these metabolism crates here. You see in this picture, we let them acclimate for, for about 72 hours. And then after 72 hours, we did a total collection of urine and feces. We fed these pigs at, at close to ad libitum, but in this case, it was about 2.8 times maintenance requirement was, was how we fed these pigs. And then we um, assessed and calculated our nitrogen balance. We measured nitrogen using a leco nitrogen analyzer on the feed, feces, and urine. And then we worked it out on a daily basis um, after what we from what we collected. So getting into just some data, some results for this, uh, as you can see here in the top part of this figure, or this table, I should say, we have the calculated crude protein percent for our phase one, two, three, and four diets, and for our low, medium, and high, and then we have our analyzed. And the students did a pretty good job of mixing the diets and formulating the diets, because they came out pretty close to where we thought they would be. Um, across the board, across all within every phase and across all three dietary treatments. So looking at some of the growth performance data, this is just the overall, so about the 
um, about 100 days of average daily gain here. As you can see, the overall growth performance, there was no difference between these three diets when it came to average daily gain. All three treatments, the pigs were gaining about a kilogram or 2.2 pounds a day. Um, and there was no diet effect or even diet by sex if we broke it out by burrows and gilts. Uh, we also saw no difference actually in average daily feed intake over the entire period with, with these three diets or on feed efficiency. So this data, this list, this data at the at a Feedham and Williams uh, standpoint, we didn't see any difference on peak performance with regard to feeding, uh, at least meeting the lysine requirement with all the soybean meal or feeding excessive soybean meal beyond the lysine requirement of these pigs. However, I just want to highlight that um, Laura and I thought it'd be, it would be important just to highlight that we, the only interaction that we saw between dietary treatment and phase was in phase two, where we saw the high soybean meal diet actually have a, have a significant, but we'll say marginal numerical increase, but it was statistically significant increase in average daily gain and also in, in feed efficiency. And so we're not sure why this was the case. It could be that the fact the pigs were going through a little, it was in the late summer and we probably had a little bit of, um, there could have been a little bit of heat stress. And then with the higher lysine to energy ratio diet in, in the high soybean meal, that could explain this, but this effect was not seen in any of the other phases. So it washed itself out. In terms of carcass merit, this is just plant data that was collected at Tyson's. As we can see on a carcass weight, we saw no difference by treatment with regard to carcass weight. Then also, um, also with loin depth, loin depth was all around the 7.7 .7 centimeters, 7.6 centimeters for both the low, medium and high soybean meal diets. However, we did see an impact on back fat depth. If we look at, um, if we look at the high, as we increase the inclusion rate of soybean meal to, to the medium and high level, we actually ended up losing about a quarter of a, a centimeter with regard to back fat. And this may be explained pretty much by the Atkins diet. The pig is probably spending more time trying to clear nitrogen out of excess nitrogen out of the body and then um, and putting energy into that rather than putting it into actual fat deposition at this point in stage um, in, in the late finishing stage. On the nitrogen balance side, I just wanted to highlight um, some of the numbers that we got from nitrogen balance, because this has implications on how you would like to, um, how you would actually model some of this data. So on the nitrogen intake and grams per day, the low soybean meal pigs were consuming about 60 grams per day in phase three, and then the medium was, was um, slightly higher at 67 grams per day. And then the high soybean meal diet pigs were, were consuming about eight, um, 82 grams of nitrogen per day. And so this just kind of falls in place that as we, as feed intake was relatively similar across, across all the treatments, but as crude protein level of the diet increased, we're just consuming more nitrogen. On nitrogen excretion, um, here's uh, nitrogen excretion in grams per day. This is on a total basis, but then the green or black bar down the bottom, the green, dark green bar is the actual fecal contribution to the total nitrogen excretion. And then this yellow bar is actually the urinary contribution or urine contribution to the nitrogen excretion or nitrogen loss from the pigs. Um, overall, there was a significant increase in nitrogen excretion as we increased, um, as we increased soybean meal inclusion from the low to medium up to the high, where we go from about 20%, or sorry, 20 grams per day of nitrogen lost up to about 40 grams per day in the um, in the high soybean meal pigs. The other thing is important to note that actually most of this nitrogen excretion is actually coming from increased urinary output. So that means the pig is actually um, digesting some of this stuff at relatively good rates, and then it's having to actually clear it through the urea cycle and actually filter it through the kidneys and then excrete it out through urine. So this does have implications um, in actually how you want to manage your pits and also manage ammonia and so forth in, in your barns. If you look at parent total tract digestibility coefficients for, um, for both dry matter and crude protein, we see no differences across the three diets with regard to parent total tract digestibility coefficients. Um, however, if we look at um, nitrogen retention on grams per day, 
um, we actually see no difference in, in nitrogen retention. In the red here, we've got that low, um, low soybean meal. Then we've got yellow is our, is our medium, and then high will be in this green. We see no differences in, in nitrogen retention in grams per day. That's not, grams of nitrogen has been retained by the pig um, in this phase three between, um, between any of our three treatments. However, if you put that on a percentage of nitrogen intake, we can see that there's pretty poor retention of nitrogen per gram of intake, which totally makes sense. This is not rocket science. The pigs are over consuming nitrogen. They're only retaining 50% of what, of what they're taking in compared to 70% that we see in the low, low soybean meal diets or the conventional diets with about 62% in the medium diet. So really overall from this kind of this part of the objective from objective one, what we saw on the growth performance is that as we increase soybean meal, either to meet the amino acid lysine requirements of the pig or even in excess of lysine requirement, we saw no impact on overall pig performance in the study that we conducted. So there was a significant diet by phase interaction only in phase two. We did not see anything in phase one, phase three or phase four of, of this study. The other thing I'd like to highlight, we did not see any kind of clinical or even subclinical signs that these, at least the high soybean meal diet where we overfed protein had any major impact on pig health or enteric health in these pigs based just off, off the amount of removals. We only had one pig actually, I think, fell out of the study and that was more, um, that was due to a prolapse. We didn't see any other and that wasn't diet related to a high soybean meal diet. So we don't think there's any health implications in this health status that we had. On a carcass merit standpoint, the high soybean meal diets actually reduced back fat at the plant. I said it was about a, it was about a yeah, quarter of a centimeter was lost, but we had no impact on carcass weight or loin depth. And so on the nitrogen side of things, on nitrogen balance side of things, nitrogen excretion was increased about 130% compared um, in our high soybean meal fed pigs compared to the low soybean meal control diets with the biggest increase really in urine nitrogen, the urinary nitrogen output as we increase the soybean meal. Fecal nitrogen somewhat stayed relatively constant, but really we saw the big increase in urinary nitrogen output. The nitrogen is, um, retention as a percentage of nitrogen intake was decreased as we, as expected, as we increased um, excess protein or nitrogen intake through the high soybean meal diets. And so really in conclusion for this first part, really high soybean meal diets in, in the levels that we went to, and again, we may be able to go higher, and I think we need to probably explore that, uh, high levels of soybean meal can replace synthetic amino acids without negatively impacting growth. However, we do have, then we have to manage higher nitrogen excretion actually in these pigs with, when they fed high soybean meal diets. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Griner to go through objective two. Thank you, Nick. And I think that was a great discussion or a great presentation on what we can see or what we can anticipate in terms of growth with our pigs as we potentially move towards having to feed high soybean meal diets to account for potential changes in ingredient costs going forward. Um, one of the parts that that Nick alluded to is there's a second objective to what we wanted to talk about today, and that was really focused around heat stress. Uh, we know that feeding more soybean meal can have the potential to have higher levels of, of fiber in the diet. And so there is this conversation around, well, if we have more fiber in the diet, do we have increased issues with heat stress? So as we were running the live animal portion of the study, the feed them and weigh them side, uh, doctors Ross and Baumgard, along with Erica Johnson, took some of the pigs that we were working with and placed them into heat chambers and did the second study. And so, again, their main question was really around what are those effects of feeding that high soybean meal diet during heat stress uh, using modern genetics and, and just looking at it from a growth perspective. So their hypothesis, just as I mentioned, would be that feeding that high protein diet would decrease performance during heat stress in pigs with modern genetics. And so that was what they anticipated finding in this, this work. So their diets look very similar. In fact, these are the same diets that we were feeding during the live animal study or the, the growth study. Um, they just looked at the low and the high. So they did not feed the intermediate diet uh, with their phase of pig. And so their low was about 
22.2% crude protein. Their high was 23.2%. And so they used 40 of the of pigs that were about 54 kilograms or about 120 pounds of, of weight. They had six treatments. And so what they had was they had two sets of pigs that were in the thermal neutral type of environment where they were fed ad libitum feed. And half of those pigs received the low diet that they label as control diet. So the low soybean meal diet going forward, you'll see as control diet. And then the other half of those thermal neutral pigs received the high soybean meal diet. Then they had a population of pigs that they placed into um, a room to simulate heat stress. And again, half of those pigs were on the low soybean meal diet or the control diet. The other half was on the high soybean meal diet. And then they had a population of pigs that they left in the thermal neutral zone or the thermal neutral area, but only fed them whatever the pigs that were in the heat stress room were eating. So they're, they're known as pear fed pigs, right? So whatever the heat stress pigs ate, that's what the, the TN pear fed group got. And again, we had the low soybean meal and we had the high soybean meal group. This is just an example of, of what they were collecting. So all the pigs were allowed an acclimation period to adjust to their room. Uh, then we went ahead and proceeded with an ad libitum access period, which is period one. And then period two, they moved into that pair feeding or matching of feed intake. Uh, they collected, of course, feed intake and they looked at temperatures because obviously this was a big part of what they were interested in. They did collect some blood samples as well as fecal and body weights. And then they also as well collected some information around loin muscle and back fat. So just to kind of get everybody's mind around what room temperatures might look like, uh, they had period one, which was just that acclimation period. And then starting um, at day one, we had the, the two groups. So we have the thermal neutral conditions, which were set at about 26.7 degrees Celsius throughout the trial. And then we had the other group that went through a cyclical heat stress. So diurnal heat stress in the evenings, the temperatures were lower um, than what they were, sorry. In the late afternoon, the temperatures were higher than what they were in the mornings. And so they replicated that for a period of three weeks. So if we look at body temperatures and, and this is a little bit busy, so I'll try to set this up for you. The red lines, both the solid and the hash lines are gonna be around the animals that were in the heat stress. So think, you know, heat is hot, it's red. So red is going to be that um, in your figures here. And then the gray bar will be the animals that were in the thermal neutral that were allowed to eat whatever they want. And then the yellow would be that pear fed group that was matched to only consume what the heat stress pigs are consuming. And so if we look at body temperature, uh, those that were in the heat stress environment uh, clearly had an elevated body temperature, whether they were on the low soybean meal diet or the high soybean meal diet relative to the other two populations. If we look a little closer at just those animals that were in that heat stress environment, we do see that there is a tendency for a heat stress response associated with the pigs that have the high soybean meal diets having a higher body temperature relative to those animals that were um, on the low soybean meal diet. And so while initially, if you look at that from day one to 11, there's really not a huge response. We do see that the longer those animals are in that environment, we start to see that those temperatures are starting to separate a bit more. If we look at respiration rate, again, red is hot. We would expect pigs that are hot to be uh, having a higher or faster respiration rate. And again, that is what this figure demonstrates is that those animals do have an elevated respiration rate compared to those animals that are in a, more of a thermal neutral environment. Again, if we look at just those animals that are in the heat stress room and we look at the difference between those that are on the low soybean meal diet and the high soybean meal diet, we again see a difference in treatment or dietary effect here in that those animals that were on the high soybean meal diet have an elevated respiration rate compared to those that were on that low or that control diet. And this though actually goes throughout the study. So while the body temperatures maybe didn't diverge as fast, uh, we do see the respiration rates that do appear to be elevated throughout the 21 days or 22 days. 
So in their experiment, again, as I mentioned, they did measure some similar parameters. And so here they looked at feed intake. Um, this time, the red is going to be on the bottom because, again, animals that are hot should eat less feed. And we do see that uh, they are eating less feed than the gray animals, the thermal neutral animals. They're allowed to eat whatever they want to eat. Um, so there is clearly an environment uh, effect here on this study. If we look again at just those animals that were in the heat stress environment, we um, actually do not see any significant differences across this study in terms of feed intake. So while there are some deviations that are visible, uh, science, uh, statistically, that wasn't strong enough to be a, a true impact. So um, instead of collecting feces or urinary nitrogen, this group collected blood urea nitrogen. And again, we would anticipate that if we're feeding high soybean meal diets, based on what we saw in our study, we would see elevated blood urea nitrogen levels in those animals that are fed high soybean meal diets. And this is exactly what they were able to demonstrate with the hash lines all being around the high soybean meal diets and the solid lines being those of the animals on the low soybean meal diets. So this matches up very nicely. The animals are absorbing that high, that higher level of nitrogen from those high soy, soybean meal diets and processing it, passing it through their kidneys, and then it's going out into the manure. If we look at their performance indicators with the heat stress environment, um, what we do see is average daily gain is reduced with those animals that are in the heat stress environment. And it's also reduced in the animals that are pear fed because again, they're essentially being limit fed compared to their, their gray counterparts that are ad lib fed. So we would anticipate that feed intake uh, would be lower in those animals, but we do not have a dietary interaction, meaning the high soybean meal diet pigs performed at the same level as those in the lower soybean meal level or lower soybean meal diets, even in rooms of heat stress. Uh, the same with feed efficiency. Actually, we do not see any significant differences between the control group and the high soybean meal group. Uh, rather, it is based on the environment only. And so maybe a little bit different than what Nick and I saw as far as just with that one period in our growth study, but then if we look at the overall growth data, we did not see a difference. And this is exactly what this is demonstrating as well. Um, when we look at changes in back fat and loin muscle, or yeah, loin mass or loin muscle area, sorry, I cannot talk tonight. Um, what we do see here is that there is a change in back fat. So our animals that are in the heat stress rooms, as well as their pair fed, have a lower level of back fat. Again, this is very supportive of what Nick and I saw in our portion of the study as well. Uh, we do see, again, that there are no statistical differences between those animals that are fed the low soybean meal or the high soybean meal, but rather in this case, it's just related um, to the heat stress. If we look over here at, at LMA, again, we don't see any significant differences um, across the treatments, but we do see that there is an environmental impact. So again, and just kind of in conclusion for what uh, doctors Ross and Baumgard saw in, in their work that was matching with, with ours at the time, the rectal temperature and respiration rates increased in both the heat stress groups. Um, that increase in that group was a little bit higher with the high soybean meal relative to the, the low soybean meal groups. Um, in addition to that, production performance did appear to be decreased in the animals that were heat stressed which would be expected and something that we see across the Midwest during the summer months. However, in their study, feeding the high soybean meal diets did not exasperate that negative effect of the high soybean meal diets, or sorry, negative effects of heat stress. So what does this all mean? We just gave you a ton of data in a very short amount of time. Um, we did not choose to run any economics today. Uh, Nick and I discussed that quite heavily. Um, but because we don't really know exactly where corn's going to fall and soybeans going to fall, we didn't really feel that there was much value in putting that out here. And really, when we think about what we are seeing in, in these data sets, your ROI is probably going to come more from the manure because uh, while you're going to reduce feed costs overall, if, if soybean meal levels drop or price drops, um, where you potentially have the potential to really change your ROI is how you're handling that manure as Nick indicated, 
uh, based on what you're going to place that value in terms of nitrogen in that manure at. Um, but we do want to give you a few cautionary statements based on what we have provided you today. Uh, we want to make sure that you understand that we don't know all of the answers here. As Nick alluded, we don't know how high we can go if we feed high soybean meal diets. It's really important, especially based on the fact of, of what Nick demonstrated with the uh, nitrogen excretion with that extra nitrogen coming out in urine that we monitor the barn and the pit ammonia as well as the air quality. Uh, this is a piece that we're currently working on as well. Uh, one of my graduate students is trying to better understand the gas emission rates of high soybean meal diets uh, currently and, and we'll have data for that at another at another webinar. In addition to that, how you manage that manure, your land applications and so forth will need to be considered. And lastly, as we increase high soybean meal diets, we definitely want to be monitoring that anti-nutritional factor, that trypsin inhibitor that most of us are concerned about. Uh, Nick's group is currently working on some more data around that. And again, hopefully in the near future, we'll have some data to share with you on that and what that impact could be as we increase those soybean meal levels in the diet, even potentially further than, than what we've demonstrated tonight. So uh, we'd be remiss not to thank and acknowledge the people as well as the funding sources that have helped with these studies. Uh, the objective one work was done predominantly by an undergraduate, Joe Swanstrom, and then the graduate student team of, of both Nick and myself, so Dalton Humphrey, Sarah Elfson, Kayla Miller, Spencer Becker, Chloe Hagen, and Mitch Nestle as well as our two uh, swine nutrition farm staff, uh, Trey Faber and Tim Hicks. And this work was funded by Iowa Pork Industry Center. And again, we wanna thank Tyson for allowing us to come in and, and be able to gather some carcass data. Objective two, uh, most of the work or all the work that was presented in objective two is part of Erica Johnson's uh, master's dissertation. And so we're very grateful that she was willing to allow us to share the work today. Uh, and then, of course, the Ross and Baumgard lab, as well as the POS committee and, and multiple others who assisted uh, with this project as well. So, with that, we want to thank you for your time and your attention. And Chris, we're going to turn it back over to you to field any questions from the audience. Yeah, thank you, Nick and Laura, uh, for some really fantastic information. Just a reminder to the audience, if you want to ask Nick or Laura any questions, you can just go ahead and drop those into the chat box. I do have a couple of questions that came in during the presentation. Uh, first question uh, is what energy value was used for soybean meal relative to corn during the diet formulations? And what don't use? Yeah, so we would have used the, the NRC documented values for ME. Uh, for soybean meal and corn. All right, very good. Next question uh, would be, would you anticipate the same effect of heat stress if a heavier pig was evaluated or if the pigs were heavier at near the end? I would expect heat stress to make it um, worse on them. So that would be more, they'll take longer to dissipate the heat that they would accumulate over that 22 day period. So a 300 pound pig would be a lot worse off than what, what these pigs would have been. And so then the impact on high protein in the diet or high soybean meal, uh, based on what we've seen, there's some little bit of differences there, but I don't know if that would actually also be exacerbated, but definitely heat stress would be a lot worse. The phenotype of heat stress would be worse. Where well, I mean, we're seeing that this week. Yeah, absolutely. Last question uh, would be, uh, as you talked about uh, the high soybean meal levels that you use this time, are, are there any plans to replicate this with even higher soybean meal levels than what you used in this study? Uh, short answer is yes. Um, Laura and I are working on multiple study, like follow-up studies in different avenues. So one, yeah, one of the studies would be to go see where we could actually find the point where it's actually going to be a, um, a problem uh, on on peak performance. So could we, we only went to like 46, 48% was our highest in that phase one. Mm -hmm. Up to 60% um, or 65%, 70%. Um, 
there's probably is a break somewhere up there. Um, so we will be planning a study to do that. And then, yeah, then we'll also try this stuff going on with regard to the pit odors and manure management on the nitrogen cycling side of things that will also kind of tie into some of that stuff. All right, very good. With that, that's all the questions that I have or that I see in the chat box. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Gabler and Dr. Greiner again uh, for the excellent presentation and uh, encourage you to come back next month. Uh, well, as we continue on with our monthly series of the Iowa Pork Industry Center web uh, webinars, have a very pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.